I think a lot of us uh, have trouble uh, along this line. We go up in school to someone and we say, uh, I notice really that uh, you are a bit loose in your relationships with your girlfriend. And uh, they say, well, that's my life, isn't it? It's up to me what I do. And you say, well, I mean, I'm a Christian and uh, Jesus has said that you should not uh, commit fornication and uh, that your relationships with uh, the opposite sex should be pure and should be filled with uh, non-selfish love. And you should be free from any desire to get from your girlfriend but want to give. And the other person says, well, that's interesting. I'm not a Christian and that's your problem and it's not mine. And uh, we go home that night and we say, Lord, we've had a hard day witnessing and nothing. (laughs) And it's so easy, you know, to make an impression of a certain kind of moralist. And that's all you do. Or you go up to somebody else at the end of a class and you say, what do you do on Sundays? And they say, well, I fish and water ski. And you say, well, you know, it's Sunday. It belongs to God. And I go to the campus church. And really, it's a corny place. You should come and see (laughs) what goes on there. And then you discuss it. And then they discuss the church they used to go when they were young. And you discuss the pastors and the people and the choirs. And you leave feeling, well, that wasn't a very successful witness. And again and again, we find ourselves driven into being moralists or being certain kind of churchmen. Or it's even worse if uh, we use the Campus Crusade presentation without the Spirit. Because we go to them with our four spiritual laws and we take them through it and nothing happens. And suddenly we realize the magic did not work. And we wonder, why are we having such a tough time witnessing? Now, dear ones, do you see that it's impossible to witness unless you have come through the same experience as the apostles themselves? Now, you remember that the one unique thing about Christianity is Jesus. He is different from Muhammad. Muhammad was an ordinary man, never claimed to be God's son. He's different from Buddha. Buddha didn't even believe in God. He's different from Confucius. Confucius didn't even say he was a prophet of God. He called himself a philosopher. He's different from all the Hindu gods because we could see and touch him. And there were people who lived and saw and touched him and knew he was real. Jesus is far superior to all other so-called prophets of religion because he claimed to be God's son and he defended his claim by rising from the dead and walking among us for 40 days. So Jesus is the unique person in Christianity. And yet do you see that at the end of his life, he told the apostles that they didn't have all they needed? That's right. He said, listen, you know me. You know me better than any other men have ever come to know God. But you don't have enough. Now, loved ones, would you look with me at at that place where Jesus said that? It's Acts and chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and and verse 4. And while staying with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem. You see, he commanded them. It was as important as that. He said, don't leave Jerusalem. A lot of us, you see, would be wild keen to get all over the world and tell everybody about Jesus. But he said, don't depart from Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father, which he has said... You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but before many days, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, many of us, you know, take that uh, and we say, oh, yeah, well, that's all right. That's what you mean by becoming a Christian. Uh, When you become a Christian, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. No, that's the new birth. When you come to Jesus and give him your whole life, then he gives you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit regenerates your spirit and makes you aware and conscious of the spiritual world of God. But that's the new birth. The disciples, you see, experience that. You, you could look at it, John 20, it is, and verse 22, where they experience the new birth. John 20 and verse 22. And when he had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
Now, you see, they were Christians in the sense that many of us are. They had received the Holy Spirit, but even though they had, Jesus said, listen, wait, there's more of the Holy Spirit that you have to receive. So do you see, brothers and sisters, that it's not an argument about, you know, whether you receive the Holy Spirit when you're born of God. Of course you do. That's the only way you can be born of God. That's what makes you different from a a Mohammedan. When a Mohammedan becomes a Mohammedan, he just decides to follow Muhammad's rules and practice his ceremonial and his moral laws. When a Christian becomes a Christian, the supernatural spirit of God comes into that Christian and makes him alive and aware of God. But do you see that even after that, something is needed? And Jesus felt it was so important that he said, listen, don't leave until you receive this. And you remember throughout the New Testament, you find that they laid the same emphasis on this need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You remember in Acts 8, we read it before, but some of you are are here for the first time this morning, and it might be good to look at it. In Acts 8, you remember Philip went to Samaria, and he preached, and many of them became uh, Christians. In verse 12, Matthew uh, Acts 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. Now, look at verse 14. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. We say, but hadn't they already? Yes, they'd received him in the new birth. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, it's not enough just to be born of the Spirit. And brothers and sisters, that's why so many of us have trouble with our witnessing lives. Because you see, you can only be a witness after you've received the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that's what Jesus said. He said in Acts 1 and verse 8 there. Acts 1 and 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be. Not you have to try to be. You better do your best. You better work up all the arguments you can for Christianity. But you'll automatically be. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In other words, the Holy Spirit will enable you to be a witness. And without the baptism with the Holy Spirit, you'll never be a witness at all. You'll simply be a moralist or a theologian or a certain kind of churchman. But you'll never be someone who witnesses to the beauty of Jesus' life. Now, do you see the word witness there in verse 8? Witnesses. That's the Greek word martyres. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to see which English word Marturio produced from the Greek. It produced the English word martyr. Now, a martyr is one who is willing to die for his faith. Now, do you see a witness is one who has not simply come alive to God, but one who is ready to die to his own life and his own plans for his own life and is ready to live for Jesus' glory alone. Now, brothers and sisters, don't you see there's a difference between that and what many of us enter into at the new birth. Many of us at the new birth are preoccupied with getting clear of hell and getting our sins forgiven and getting things right between ourselves and God for our own salvation. Now you see that in order to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, it requires a complete switch in that egocentricity. It requires a complete turning from self And a complete turning to Lord Jesus and saying, Lord, you are going to be Lord of my life. Every part of it. The petting part, the future part, the ambition part, the swearing part, the irritable part. Every part of my life, it's yours to do what you want with. And as a result of that, Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. And that's what you need in order to be a witness. Now, what difference does the Holy Spirit make to your own life? Well, he makes you like Jesus. That's really the heart of it. See, Muhammad could only say, follow my laws. Buddha could only say, follow my eightfold path to enlightenment. 
The Hindu prophets could only say, worship and respect the gods. But Jesus said, I'm going to send you a third person of our Trinity family. And he's going to take my life and he's going to give it to you. It's not just a matter of you trying to imitate me or trying to follow me or do your best to observe my laws. This Holy Spirit that I'm going to send you is going to take off the things that are mine and make them real in your own life. Now, dear ones, that's what produces supernatural, effortless witnessing. When we experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that he gives us the very life of Jesus. See, again and again at school, you know what the kids are impressed by is your balance emotionally. Or your intellectual integrating of life's problems. Or they're impressed with the friends that you have. Or the kind of atmosphere that there is in a group like this. But so rarely they actually are impressed with Jesus. So rarely they're able to see past all those things and receive Jesus himself. Now that can only happen if the Holy Spirit begins to make Jesus' life alive inside you. Now the uh, symbol for the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was oil. And you remember, a man could be born a prophet, but he didn't enter into his function as a prophet until he was anointed with oil. Now, you can see the same is true with the Holy Spirit. You can be born into God's family, but you cannot represent God's family to the rest of the world until you're anointed with his holy oil, the Holy Spirit. And that's, you remember, what happened to Jesus himself. A lot of us feel, oh, well, now, Jesus didn't need this. But would you look at Luke 4, it is, and verses 18 and 19. And you'll see that he was in the same situation, even though he was born of the Spirit. Yet he needed to experience this anointing of the Spirit or this baptism with the Spirit before he engaged on his own ministry. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. You remember he got up in the temple, in the synagogue, and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, Jesus could not have done any of those things if he had not been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Now, what difference does the Holy Spirit's anointing make? Well, if you divide the English word anointing into two, you can see that it has the same etymological stem as ointment. And that will give you a little illustration of the kind of difference the baptism of the Holy Spirit will make to your own life. If you like to look at the story about the ointment in John it is, and chapter 12 and verse 3. John chapter 12 and verse 3. Mary took a pound of costly ointment of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Now, the greatest thing that the Holy Spirit does when he baptizes you is he fills you with the fragrance of Jesus himself. Now, dear ones, it's just different. If you try to put on that old sweetie, sweetie stuff, it'll just turn everybody off, you know? And you try to be lovey-dovey and show care for them, you know, philanthropic kind of care and concern. It'll just turn them off because they know it's something you turn on. But when you really are willing to die to self and willing to abandon yourself to Jesus for his purposes alone and willing to allow him to baptize you completely with his own spirit, then the Holy Spirit takes up the fragrance of Jesus' life and fills it into your life, and you just become a different person. Now, loved ones, your conscience, you know, becomes a delight to you. It just becomes a garden of spices instead of a place that sends up sour smells to you all the time. And you become, you know, a, a beauty in the church, not one of those creatures that you meet every time, you know, and how are you doing? Oh, okay, struggling, you know. Or someone 
that you're prepared to represent Jesus as long as you yourself are represented. But dear ones, when the Holy Spirit baptizes you, he fills you with the fragrance of Christ. So that you see, you can work beside a person in a lab all day, not say a word about Jesus, and they sense the presence of Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, do you see that's what we need on our campuses? Don't you see that we're going to get tired of sharing? Don't you see that the poor non-Christian is going to get tired of just sharing without the life? The sharing is all right if the life is behind it. But brothers and sisters, the four spiritual laws are death if there isn't a life to back them up. And do you see that we're going to find Satan creating a tremendous backlash against the whole move of the Spirit among us? unless our lives begin to represent the fragrance of Christ, whether we're talking about him or not. Well, that's one of the great things the Holy Spirit does. Some of the other things, you know, you can find if if you begin to uh, take apart the oil that they used in Old Testament times. It wasn't just ordinary oil. It had different kinds of ingredients. And if you look at those, it's just an illustrative way of showing you some of the things that the Holy Spirit can do in your own life. Uh, One of the ingredients was myrrh, Uh, you remember, that they presented to Jesus. And myrrh is used to take the soreness out of a bruise. Now, when the Holy Spirit baptizes you with himself, you can't be hurt. Now, it's glorious. And somebody cuts you right across, tears apart everything that you believe in and everything that you value, and there's no pain. Now, dear ones, that's good. Do you see that that's what witness is? You see, anyone can witness about Jesus when they're in good form and everybody is treating them nicely. But it's when somebody cuts you right down to size and then instead of that bruise being felt in your heart, there rises out a great love for them. And you begin to look at them and say, Oh, you poor souls, you're going to stub your toe kicking that old dead horse down there. Because you've been crucified with Christ There's no self to defend. There's no reputation to uphold. There's no brilliant intellect to prove or to justify. You've been crucified with Christ. And the Holy Spirit fills you with that readiness to accept persecution or criticism without any soreness in the bruise. Now, dear ones, a real Christian, you can see, is someone who cannot be hurt. Now, dear ones, there is no place for wrapping ourselves up and saying, Oh, I got hurt today. If you knew the way they treated me. And loved ones, you know, that even though we laugh at it, yet how often have we gone to bed crying with self-pity inside if not out? Now, dear ones, do you see? It's because we have not experienced that baptism with the Holy Spirit that Jesus has to give us. Uh, Another, you know, ingredient of the old oil is cinnamon. And cinnamon was used in the old days to stimulate and to make people active and alert and alive. And when the Holy Spirit baptizes you with himself, you're always ready to do things for God, you know. Before you baptize with the Holy Spirit, you'll do it if it's convenient. Well, if it so happens that you're in that place on Sunday, or if you feel like getting up this Sunday morning, you'll go. But when the Holy Spirit baptizes you with himself, you're always ready for Jesus' business. You're ready to go here or to go there because your life is utterly devoted to him. It's not yourself plus him. It's not yourself and him when it's convenient. It's him and him only. And so it's no trouble. Nothing is any trouble. And loved ones, what a freedom from burden that is. You know? A lot of you are great souls, you know? But, dear, love you. You are Christians who are still carrying the heavy burden because really the full surrender has not yet come. And you're saying, yes, I love him, but. Yes, I will do it, but. And there's a great but in your life. And there's a great Jesus plus in your life. There's a great plus. It has to be Jesus plus the little bit of satisfaction on the water skis. Jesus, plus the little bit of satisfaction in getting a good reputation. Jesus, plus getting a good financially secure job. Do you see that Jesus can only baptize and use those who care only for him, who are baptized with the stimulating power and life of the Holy Spirit? Now it's so, you know, with uh, the other ingredients. There are others. There's one called cassia and one called calamus. And the calamus was used in the old days for taking the sarnus out of the stomach. I suppose it was a kind of Alka-Seltzer. And that's really what the Holy Spirit does. When the Holy Spirit baptizes you with himself, 
you have never met a sarpus. That's right. That's right. You don't see the sourness in people. And the sourness doesn't come into your own spirit. The Holy Spirit is bringing the sweetness and the life of Jesus so positively that those people could be saying anything to you and it isn't penetrating, it isn't coming in and poisoning. And so really a Christian is someone who never sees the unchristlike part of another person. It doesn't matter whether that person is a Christian or not, the Christian never sees the unchristlike part of them. They see the Christ-like part. And someone comes along to you and starts crit- criticizing uh, someone else to you and you say, oh yeah, But boy, they really have patience, don't they? Or they can really sing well, can't they? And dear ones, do you see that when the Holy Spirit baptizes a group of people, the place is like heaven on earth. Because there is no negativism. And there is no sourness. And there is no miserable self-pity and self-love and self-centeredness. And all the touchiness goes miraculously. Brothers and sisters, you can see that's what the world really is trying to get at. It says, you know, all it needs is love. It doesn't really know what it means by love, but that's really what it wants. And that's what all the utopia visions are about. And you see that Jesus is able to make us such a body of people here on earth. But you need to be willing to come into this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you say, you know, oh, well, now, Pastor, what will it cost? Well, it costs you everything. Everything you are. It means you need to come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I know you didn't only bear my sins. I know on Calvary when you died, I died. God destroyed all this miserable self-pity, all this miserable sarcasm and irritability, all this miserable inadequacy and negativism with you. Lord, I'm willing for you to make that real in my life. And then let the Holy Spirit begin to work on you and begin to show how much of that self is still alive. And then, dear ones, you'll come to a time when you see that, yes, I am really willing, Lord Jesus. I don't care whether I ever get married. I don't care whether I ever ever am financially secure. I don't care whether I'm successful in my parents' eyes or unsuccessful. I don't care what happens to me. I'm willing to live or to die from now on for you and for you only. And then, dear ones, when that moment comes, when you come to the ground of your heart, when you come to a place where you really admit you are not your own, you are bought with a price, and you belong to Jesus for him to do what he wants with, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it has come to us all differently. You know. Some dear ones have come to it with tongues. Some of us have come to it with just with a clear sense of cleanliness and victory in our hearts that we'd never known before. But the Holy Spirit will baptize you in the way that is just right for you. But dear ones, without that, the witnessing is just heavy going. You know. It's just heavy going. And it really usually resolves itself into ideology, a sharing of ideology. Now, if you say to me, now, Pastor, do you mean that I should stop witnessing until I'm baptized with the Spirit? Brothers and sisters, God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey. You have to obey the Holy Spirit. You have to witness in order to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. No, you need to keep witnessing and obeying what God has told you to do with all your heart. But you constantly need in your prayer times to be dealing with Jesus about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, I know that it's late. I could maybe take two questions, if there were two questions. Uh, We usually do this in the evening, and uh, I know it's... Maybe God doesn't want questions. Eric. What about the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit? It seems, dear ones, that the apostles had the gift of discernment and were able to see when a brother or sister was in a place of total surrender and a readiness to die utterly with Christ. And so they had that gift of discernment, and they laid on hands to confirm the faith that already was existing in the heart. But I think, Eric, I think I know there are brothers and sisters here for, uh, who, who would believe strongly in that. I think they would agree that it's only a confirmation. It cannot stimulate a faith that is not there. Uh, So it's important, I think, to steer away from all purely physical manifestations. I think it's important to see the only reason Jesus won't baptize us with the Holy Spirit is because we really don't want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We don't want to live for him alone. Uh, Brother? Uh, 
Brother, Jesus led us to set up the bookshop that we have and our whole ministry specifically, you know, to try to help a brother or sister who was involved with that. And in the bookshop, we've tried to outline clearly the steps in the Christian life. And so we have the right books under the right sections. And there is one on the new birth. Then there is one on baptism with the Spirit. And it's in two sections, one uh, filling with the Spirit for purity and anointing with the Spirit for power. And there are books there that will help you. I've tried to write a little booklet, Free to Live, uh, uh, which, which ex- expressed how God dealt with me and gives some guidance on how to enter in yourself. And uh, I think we'll have that in the entrance hall. And you could get it in the bookshop. But basically, brother, there are two facts to be faced. You need to face that we were crucified with Christ. That's the first fact. You need to exercise faith in that fact, that I have no right to my own life to do what I want with it. I have been crucified with Christ, therefore I am dead to myself. The second fact is present faith in the Holy Spirit. Present faith in the Holy Spirit. Now, how to enter into both of those, you need to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, why is Jesus not able to baptize me? And the Holy Spirit will begin to show you disobedience in your life or wrong attitudes or wrong motives that you have. And as you bring those under him, then Jesus will bring you time to a time when he'll say, you are ready. I will baptize you now with the Holy Spirit. So the heart of it is faith, brother. But faith includes willingness or obedience plus belief. That's very brief, brother. I'm very conscious of the inadequacy of that. And that's why I point you to the, the books a little more into that little book. Sister. Water baptism. And do you want, I think that the basic, the, the vital thing, you can't talk about the whole subject, but the vital thing to see is that it's in line with what Eric said, that water baptism uh, and laying on of hands will not create a spiritual work which God alone can do. And so water baptism is important in its place, as scripture outlines it, but it will not create the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Dear ones, it seems to me that, that uh, the practice, the prevalent practice was that uh, they were baptized uh, when they believed in Jesus. And it seems that that is so. Whether it was always uh, immersion, whether they had always enough water or not, I don't know, that's the big issue. I think the big issue is that as far as the Father is concerned, when they went under that water, they were buried with Christ. When they came up, they were new creations coming out in a resurrection. Dear ones, I'm sorry, but I really think we have to hold it there. We don't normally do it on Sunday mornings. Sunday evening, tonight, dear ones, we have about half an hour of questions after the sermon. I'm trying to talk on the life of faith. So, oh, I pray that if you know that this is what you need, you'll begin to seek God. And he'll give it to you in the way that you need it, you see. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you made each one of us so each of us is equally dear in your eyes. Now, Lord God, we trust you to show us by the Holy Spirit how each one of us can come into the baptism with the Holy Spirit that is needed in order to be witnesses to Jesus. And so that your Son may live again in this world and be seen and be heard because he lives fully in us. We trust you to do this for your glory. Amen.